Whistler. I'm a uh, journalist. I cover the Fed and the U.S. economy for Bloomberg News. So I'm pretty excited to uh, be here moderating this panel because we have a lot of uh, uh, topics that I think you'll find are, are both near and dear to what I do and are very relevant to the entire uh, policy discussion right now. So. Uh, Warren Mosler is going to get us started off, and he's presenting a paper by uh, Giacomo Bracci, who is an economist at the University of Trento. Um, he could not be with us today, which is why Warren is presenting. I suppose Warren probably doesn't need much introduction among his crowd, but author of Soft Currency Economics, The Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy, and of course, a longtime uh, pioneer of modern monetary theory. Um, and then after that, we're going to hear from Daniele Basu. Uh, who is with Rete MMT Italia, and he's going to talk about uh, full employment and price stability and uh, look at some employer of last resort policies and, and sort of compare that with the more traditional approaches. Um, and then Linwood Tauhi, who is, uh, of course, a, a professor here at UMKC, is going to talk about um, development and ways in which uh, governmental entities that do not issue their own currencies can still finance economic development. And then finally, uh, we have uh, Panayotis uh, Ya, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Yanakouros, who is going to look at the role of econometrics uh, in modern monetary theory. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Warren, get us started. We'll do uh, 15 minutes for each presentation, then we'll open it up to Q&A. So thanks again. Okay, hi, Jacques in Trento. Here. I've got the latest draft of the paper, so if anybody wants a copy, warren.mosler at gmail.com, and I'll get you a quick time. I'll get you an email a copy or a link to it. Okay, uh, this is about the. Taxation in the non neutral way. And the abstract, the introduction, what I've done is taken segments of it. This is what I think are some of the highlights, and then I'll give them a brief discussion of each slide. How much time do I have? Ah, 15 minutes. I'll give you five minutes. Okay. Paper shows how the introduction of taxation as a coercive non market mechanism imposed by the government on the private sector necessarily obviates any notion of neutrality with regards to. Assume at least long run neutrality and 
some of them short-run neutrality and some of them short-run non-neutrality. Well, what we're saying is it's not possible to have any seconds of neutrality. And yet, that's what's guiding all monetary policy right now. So, Section 2, Surveys and Contributions, uh, Historical Contributions. Here you go. Real economic variables are not affected by monetary variables. That's right. Output gap, the reason for unemployment is because markets haven't been allowed to clear from something. 
that's that's the, the thing that's clogging it up. Now, depending on your politics, and most of the people there would be like the labor unions, wages won't adjust or something like that. That's why Congress won't do it. Haynes rejects neutrality. Does it for almost for different reasons? Okay. Again, what he's saying is that if money was neutral, you wouldn't have the rules of us to begin with. So it's obviously not neutral. <coughs> That's why we're happy because the neutral is clear all the time. Okay. <coughs> so he starts with that. Program. Point is here that one of the Keynesian revolutions or whatever the difference is is about money, yeah. monetary policy, fiscal policy not being neutral. The increase in importing due to negative profit expectations or any cost of uncertainty can translate into lower sales for businesses. So what he's saying is currency does matter because if people don't spend, then you get no sales, no output. Now that is under consumption theory, by the way, from 1589 or something. Call it that shows. Yeah, that the demand for money is created by taxation has been 
been around for a while. It's just never been part of the general dialogue. Theory of the price level has been trying to do this. They disappoint them. Okay, I'm the 
probability as the length by uh, Warren Moser in uh, his paper uh, of, uh, about uh, 20 years ago. So like in a movie of uh, Woody Allen and Warren, feel free to tell me that uh, I didn't know anything about uh, your work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the uh, first point, uh, savings uh, not offset cause uh, unemployment in uh, uh, savings are normal in a monetized economy and uh, uh, the net financial assets uh, uh, by the monopolies can accommodate savings and allow uh, full employment in every moment. And uh, selling at a fixed price, currency exchange for hours of work, as much as the customers uh, desire. So customers are uh, unemployed. Okay. Uh, full employment, uh, we see full employment as a primary target for ethical reasons and as angle of price stability. Okay. Uh, what are the, the main points? It relies on public deficits and creation of uh, net, financial, net financial assets okay, that are function of full employment. That is, the state targets the full employment and then uh, create the necessary net financial assets. It's oriented to public purpose and uh, doesn't involve, it should not uh, involve significant, significant increase in uh, consumption of uh, not uh, renewable resources. Okay. And uh, uh, this is important, uh, the program of uh, full employment uh, must be structured with the universal access for, uh, that is uh, all people able to work and uh, looking uh, for a job uh, should uh, access to, uh, to the program. Uh, we can see in uh, the structure of uh, the, uh, in the framework of full employment and price stability uh, similar points to uh, the condition where a monopolist supplier of public, of public services uh, has got the duty <coughs> to guarantee a minimum standard of the supply good at a fixed price. Uh, in, uh, we can see this in water, electricity, electricity gas uh, managed under uh, public authorities. Okay. In, uh, uh, in the MMT world and uh, post-Canadian world, we have uh, several definitions of uh, what is full employment. Uh, there is a range between an high level uh, optimal uh, full employment, uh, it is all those needing uh, to work to attend a socially normal, uh, uh, no grand consumption expectations, are able to get a job, providing them with enough income, either from the private sector under normal conditions or from uh, the state. Uh, this is a, a, a high level of uh, full employment. Uh, but uh, there is, a, we said, a range, and uh, full employment in uh, full employment and price stability um, shows um, a scheme with a minimum wage level standard that is uh, uh, a lower level, but above the misery minimum wage. So this is a, uh, uh, this is a, the proposal, and. Uh, it's intended for generic and skilled workforce. And uh, uh, MMT activists, uh, activists uh, should be honest with people. That is, uh, full employment uh, in this proposal is not uh, uh, the job of your dreams. Okay. Uh, it's a, a generic and skilled job uh, for, uh, uh, for public purposes. And uh, it could result in underemployment uh, respect to individual specific competences, competences of uh, unemployed people. Okay. Uh, we have the set case in the uh, Eurozone and, uh, and Italy. The Euro system is uh, 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 rooted in austerity. The European Central Bank can't offset directly savings and doesn't guarantee uh, officially uh, government deficits. Okay, savings not offset uh, cost and employment. The system could be technically arranged, uh, but at the moment uh, it's an uh, it, it's a robot. 
it's an uh, automaton out of uh, political discussion. Okay, it's structured on two export uh, meetings, uh, the old system, and uh, it's doing its job. Um, what if a state, for example, Italy, exited from the euro system? Italy faces a, a grave problem. That is, uh, these are uh, three articles of the Italian constitutional law. The first article states that the Italian Republic is founded on war, and workers have the right to a decent living wage. This is the first article of uh, our constitutional law. The Italy guarantees uh, and uh, uh, supports savings. And uh, uh, the third point uh, from uh, uh, five years ago, Italy targets a balanced budget. Uh, that is foolish. Okay. So we have in this situation <laughs> where at least one of them. <laughs> At least one of them must be killed. <laughs> okay. They cannot, uh, cannot live uh, at the same moment, uh, all, of, all of them. Uh, some, uh, some reflection about uh, <coughs> past and actual alternative tools. Uh, unemployed, we have had uh, unemployment even in phases of economic growth. And uh, it has been it, it has been uh, used as a disciplinary tool, as uh, normally uh, we, we see uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, the alternative tools has been uh, fiscal uh, relaxations, uh, official and not uh, official, to stimulate uh, business sectors uh, involving high private debt and uh, high use of. Uh, Unskilled, uh, unskilled uh, workers, uh, typically the uh, building sector. Okay. Solution that uh, we call the uh, INDI, that is the contrary of uh, not in my back uh, years, that is regions with high unemployment and uh, weak environmental systems accept highly uh, polluting enterprises with the low ecologic standards in order to attract uh, enterprises and uh, high people. Okay. And the, the last unconventional monetary policies uh, like uh, quantitative uh, easing, in uh, all of these tools, uh, full employment is a collateral effect. It's not the main target. And uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, we have public deficits oriented to stimulate private deficits for private purposes. And uh, an increase in consumption of not uh, renewable resources. Uh, this is the situation uh, of the building sector in uh, Europe. Uh, we can say that uh, there is no uh, there is no growing, uh, no significant, significant uh, growth in the sector. And uh, uh, all uh, these tools um, have uh, uh, hidden costs. For example, uh, costs from uh, facilitations in the uh, building sector uh, lead uh, to easy building licenses in areas with high hydrogeological risks, and uh, uh, in a second moment, the damages from uh, houses that uh, have been built in uh, weak environmental areas. Uh, the syndrome, uh, please, in my backyard, you can uh, see here the translation. Uh, this is an enterprise that uh, uh, made the damages to the environment, and uh, the, there was in uh, we are, we are six years ago between the, the need of uh, employment for the region and the damages made by by the company. Okay. Uh, third point, in uh, depressed areas, criminal organizations play a sort of uh, local monopolist role in the local mon money uh, supply chain, selling currency at high price in exchange for hours of work sold by the uh, unemployed buffer stock. Okay, um, I don't talk about uh, quantitati quantitative easing because uh, all of us, I think, uh, know that uh, it's not. Uh, it's 
it's not a, a tool target uh, targeting uh, full employment. We propose here a comparison uh, scheme between uh, the uh, proposal, fiscal tolerance, quantitative easing, and uh, the employer of last resort proposal. Uh, so um, the employer of last resort proposal is uh, rational for the state. So why uh, does not the state apply the employer of last resort proposal? Because as uh, uh, the Nobel Prize and Herbert Simon underlined, uh, the state and every organization is not rational. Uh, every organization, every big organization is a field of battle okay, between uh, different uh, groups. So uh, unemployment uh, is uh, uh, rational for the group that controls uh, the state. And currently, exporters are in uh, charge. Governments, economy, media, so unemployment uh, is uh, rational for uh, this, uh, this group. And the full employment uh, is the perpetual political issue that uh, Kalevsky uh, underlined. Uh, the paradox is that an employment uh, of last resort uh, role played by the state would remove class uh, conflict in more, in more of political space and would make stronger the working class, but cannot be introduced uh, if the working class is not politically strong enough. Uh, two opposite risks uh, about the transitional job claims. In case of low workers replacement rate, transitional jobs could become permanent job, making, uh, making an endemic underemployment for disadvantaged groups and disadvantaged regions, cities, and so on. And uh, the second, uh, it is hopefully, high workers um, Replacement rate requires an high effort to plan and structure work programs organizatively, organizatively uh, simple and compatible with the fast replacement of the involvement, uh, involved workers. Okay. Uh, high organizative know how and complexity should be excluded. Uh, by the way, first of all, um, the state should act as. Director Sergio Leone, where full employment wins the uh, triangle, kills uh, balanced budget, <laughs> and orders govern deficit to dig a hole as deep as necessary to find the <laughs> Today, government uh, digs like a straw, so it's, uh, it's quite simple. As long as uh, the state has got the uh, MMT had little or nothing to say about development, or at least up to that time, had not. The second issue is the recent attempt by the state of California to sign into law single-payer health care system, which has been stalled over concerns about ability to pay. So those two issues. Now, it may be that uh, MMT has not been thought of as having much to say about development, because the emphasis in the MMT on sovereign currency is thought to dismiss its implementation in most developing countries, since most developing countries, uh, because of their colonial past, are still tying their currency to, to the past colonist currency. Therefore, they're not sovereign. Therefore, there's nothing they can do. Okay. Uh, notable exceptions are China, India, 
and uh, the U.S. as former colonies, and we might also note that they are all sovereign in their currency. So uh, there, there is a, an opportunity to break away from that colonial past. Right? Okay, so uh, modern money theory argues that, so that currency issuing governmental entity, sovereign in its own currency, can afford to pay for whatever it has the real resources to provide. You all know this. With monetary sovereignty and assuming such provisioning furthers development, uh, defined broadly, all I'm heard all as the upward movement of the entire social system, so I'm not putting any particular um, uh, type of development in place. Uh, money is no obstacle to development, okay? What a, when applied to sub-entities within monetary, monetarily sovereign entities, for example, states within the U.S. or countries within the, in the EU, the conclusion is that these sub-entities, not being sovereign in their own currencies, are dependent on the flow of the sovereign's currency and utilizing their stock of resources if, quote, real resources are not as limited as financial resources, such dependency con constrains potential development. Okay, so I will argue that monetary dependency, which I will call coupling, uh, trying to avoid all of the dependency literature, uh, should not be viewed as all or nothing. Provisioning that a sub-entity can accomplish with complementary in John Commons's language, uh, stocks of resources can be decoupled from the currencies, uh, sovereign's currency. In Commons's literature, uh, complementary factors are those things that you need. If you have those things, if you need to do something and you have everything you need to do, you do it, okay? Now, uh, and so a question to be answered is how much of the sovereign's currency is required for acquisition of limiting factors, those things that you don't have, you have to get from somewhere else. Uh, limiting resources, and I begin to explore the construction of a number of indices useful towards answering this question. I then discuss the state of California's recent attempt to establish single-payer health care as a model of how such decoupling might be possible. It is assumed that some resources may be limiting and therefore complete decoupling may not be possible. Okay, and so here's a model. Uh, we're all familiar with this model in some sense. We have uh, consumers, the, the C-circle, producers, government and investors. Um, consumers consume, government um, consumes, government spending. It also, uh, see if I have a, uh, yeah, okay, that didn't work. Okay, what I need is a laser. This is supposed to be one. Maybe that's it. Apologize, let me do this here. We go back. I don't even know how to do the laser on this thing. Okay. Yeah, I think I can do that. Let me see if. My laser still has any juice in it. <laughs> okay, a little bit. So uh, here we have a flow of uh, from C to G of the taxes. This flow here is transfer payments, and so I am separating government spending that goes to productive units uh, from transfer payments. Right. I'm also uh, looking at savings here and putting a, a arrow from saving the savings to the investor. Uh, that's called borrowing. And so we can separate. We can we can separate savings from from borrowing by arguing that borrowing is equal to investment, right here. But savings and borrowing are not necessarily equal. So it expands the model. So we have the domestic sector in the large circle and in the foreign sector, and those arrows going from D domestic to foreign are exports minus imports. And so we have uh, you know in the uh, upper here. Uh, fundamental identities uh, that we uh, understand going through a sexual balance process. On the bottom, I have my modifications. That is, I'm adding transfer payments um, and uh, borrowings, uh, which changes the sexual balances equation at the bottom a little bit right there. Uh, now, I have what are called circulation variables, which are uh, C, consumption, and income, so circulation going on between producers and consumers. Uh, these are 
Zika's variables, and these are injection variables, so they should be familiar with them. Now, what I'm going to do next is take this model and expand it. Uh, everything is, uh, in, in, on the domestic side, is the same. Uh, on the um, foreign side, the other entity, the, out, into the outside, I want to know where those uh, leakages and injections are going to come from. Okay. And so there's an assumption here, complementary to what's going on over here, that, for example, uh, there may be some investment from foreign entities, if I can see it, foreign entities into uh, domestic production. Okay. And other kinds of, this is a, the SD, the SF, uh, in and out are uh, savings transfers, remittances and other kinds of things. That might, might occur between uh, two uh, entities. Uh, we have other kinds of, of transfers. I have here in the large uh, blue arrow and the large red arrow a connection that only kind of makes sense in, in, in one situation. Uh, because I have uh, consumers in the domestic uh, entity paying a tax to a foreign entity, like for example a state paying, uh, consumers in the state paying taxes to the federal government. I also have a return, but there's a, I've got quote resource sharing where uh, some, of that, some of that tax dollars is returned back to the state, block grants and those kind of things. Okay, so I have that entity. So these two are coupled in the sense that they are not independent from each other. Okay, and so uh, the, the way that you read this is, uh, is uh, in CD to GD, uh, that is CD to GD is a domestic tax payment. And that's what we would normally call just uh, uh, TX. TXD uh, indicates the domestic tax payment. The uh, CD to GF, which is a leakage, CD to GF, Should be enough. No, I'm sorry. It's, it's this one here. I apologize. Right? Is uh, TXDF taxes domestic and foreign? Okay. So we are. I'm, I'm not going to go through here anymore. But uh, anyway, this is an expanded model. We're trying to uh, take into account that, that, uh, many of those as our heads might exam. Now I'm going to keep, uh, attempt. I'm going to look at one indice. And one indices of coupling would be, for example, a relationship of value X to the value of, of M. And uh, we might uh, look at that. If you can see this, I hope it's uh, you know, I have six different functional forms for such an indice. Um, and uh, for example, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the value of those forms, the function is, for example, M over X, X over M, M minus X, X minus M, or X minus M minus X over M plus X, or X minus M over X plus M, different functional forms. Uh, and under di different conditions, I'm going to look at the limits of the, uh, of the values. So when X, M equals X, this form is uh, 1 is equal to 1, uh, functional form 2 is equal to 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, their form is 0. Uh, when X is much greater than M, right? functional form of 1 is 0, the functional form of 2 is infinite. Uh, and just go down to that same 1 and 2 and n is much greater than x, uh, they would throw trolls. I don't think that's good, uh, that those are good characteristics for an index. Uh, 3 and 4, uh, the uh, functional forms are uh, negative x to x or m to negative m. Um, I also don't think those are very good. Indicator, uh, indicator values. Uh, five and six give me some, some better uh, 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 indications, or some better, um, uh, are, are I think, better for use in that they are limited from negative one to one, but they reverse themselves depending on which of the forms you use. And so uh, I, I'm choosing, for example, index six, which has the advantage of conveying the idea of D being coupled to F dependent, right, the more negative the result, and being less coupled or decoupled from that, uh, the more positive the result. 
So that's a, a possible thing there. So there's another one that I won't have time to talk about. Okay. Um, and so um, that would be the value of uh, x minus n to the value of y. Right there. Okay. N force minus x force is entirely common. Don't have time. So now this is the, the model you saw before. Right? And I'm going to put this into a scenario in which um, there's very little of a domestic economy. Most of the economy here is uh, uh, initiated from the outside. You might call this a colonial economy. And we say there's foreign investment. There are workers who are being paid in this economy. Uh, but there's no domestic production as such. Uh, there's only this foreign production, which is for the purpose of the, of the colonizer. And therefore, uh, anything that the, uh, the, the workers here need, they have to buy, they have to export, or excuse me, they have to import everything that they purchase. Uh, there's no governmental spending as such. Uh, there is governmental control, and that governmental control is funded by a uh, return of taxes. By the way, uh, CD pays taxes to the, uh, the foreign government. So all of this is happening in the foreign government currency. There's no local currency. Okay? Um, uh, these are separable balance equations. And interestingly enough, after we get through this, we, we get to uh, uh, the, the point of that x minus and then x force is a function of taxes. That is, taxes simply drink whatever might be left in the filling of the economy, so there's no savings. Right? Uh, it's the Gandhi table for that scenario, and I'm not going to go through this. Uh, I guess we're all familiar with this. But of the various transactions, uh, the bank accounts uh, for each of the entities, the consumer, the government, and so forth, and the transaction flows between them, which leads leads me to this Vincent model. Many of you might not be familiar with Vincent; it's a simulation tool. But all the uh, the rectangles are the um, uh, stocks, the um, uh, arrows are the flows, and uh, this is just a model of the identities. It's, there's there's no behavioral equations. And so what needs to be added to this are the behavioral relationship between flows and the value of initial conditions. For example, what determines how the consumer, the domestic consumer, distributes their income between uh, consumption and taxation. How is that determined? What's the level of taxation and so forth and so on? Okay, so um, here's a second scenario. Now, what I've done in the second scenario is that I've added some governmental spending in, in the form of transfer payments right? and taxation back to the local government and then spending by the uh, local uh, consumer into local production. Right? Now, I'm going to argue that that, that particular uh, circulation has nothing to do with the sovereign's currency. Okay? It's simply in a made-up currency. Uh, the with the condition being that uh, that transfer payment going out to the consumer is used to pay for products produced locally. Products come back in, and then that um, uh, all of that uh, is they're taxed away. So none of it is, stays in the system. There's no opportunity to save it. It's simply a transfer payment for uh, consumption of local goods. Uh, and, then, and then it's taxed away. Uh, none of that has anything to do with the sovereign's currency. In fact, when you do the separate uh, balance of payments, you get the same result. There, 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 there's no result monetarily for the entire system. That's all happening within the local system. Okay? And you might do that, for example, because you have unemployment in the local system and you need people to do something. And the local, the local government can, can uh, create its own currency, it doesn't have to borrow uh, 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 you know, uh, euros from a uh, uh, euro <laughs> system. It can create its own currency. Uh, many nations, many communities around the, uh, around the world are in fact doing this in the, euro, in the euro zone because they can't get their hands on enough dollars or enough euros. Therefore, they're creating their local currency to put themselves to work. Okay? So, California single payer, go through this. Uh, the, the, the attempt was tabled by the um, Speaker of the California Assembly by, by saying, well, it's too expensive. 
I mean, so even though California is not sovereign in U.S. currency, the greenback does. And if you have anything to say about California single payer funding, okay. Uh, so at, uh, in 2008, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger issued IOUs, uh, warrants, uh, because the state had run out of money. Uh, and issued warrants to vendors and employees <coughs> and uh, uh, tax tax uh, recipients or the funding the funders. And it was a temporary uh, situation. Uh, uh, Article uh, Article One, Section Ten, Clause One of the U.S. Constitution for this states from creating money for these warrants, and so they are interest paying bonds in a sense. In a sense. And so uh, they did that temporarily. Uh, let me see. Let me go back. Here. Okay. Oh, um, okay. I don't have what I need there, but anyway. Now, California itself is about forty million. People, one eighth the population in the U.S. Uh, it's a, has a GDP of 2.2 trillion dollars. It's the seventh largest economy in the world, uh, larger than France. If policy, if California were, uh, was, if California was its own country, the answer to the question of sovereignty would be obvious, as long as it doesn't follow France's example. But even though California is a state, we can dream or model uh, this. Going back to this, I'm not going to elaborate on this. But uh, here we have a, a situation where we are uh, back to a slim California model. That is, uh, California, the, the, the end result of this is as long as California can find greenbacks to, uh, to pay its tax burden. Because what happens with, tax, with, with California, like many states, is it pays taxes and what it gets back in revenue sharing is not what it pays, less than it pays. There are, there are other states that get more back. Uh, so California is subsidizing. Uh, if California was its own uh, economy and, and could supply everything it needed within California, the only greenbacks <coughs> it would need is to pay the tax differential. Now, how would we get those is the question. And uh, one way of getting those is to sell things. Uh, you sell things out of the territory and get greenbacks. Now, that's, a, that's a theoretical. Obviously, you need mechanisms for conversion of currency. Um, um, other kinds of things. Now, to my knowledge, there is no academic uh, research on the subject. Various commentators, uh, Warren Moser, Bill Mitchell, Scott Fulwell, and Evan Brown, and others weighed in at the time on social media and the possibility of turning those warrants into money <coughs> and making it acceptable for the payment of state taxes. Uh, one issue, among others, uh, which resolved all this exchange between <coughs> California currency, greenbacks, and the uh, But I'm arguing that. Uh, perhaps the cost of single payer in California could be relooked at in terms of how much how much of health how much health care does California provide for itself in a system in which its currency can circulate, and then if you need to buy um, uh, pharmaceuticals from the markets or something else, you need to find the greenbacks to pay them. But then you know that's a different that's a different. presentation mode. As we start to try to get this up, uh, my talk will will 
shift gears a little bit toward uh, how we communicate uh, and in particular where we spend our, our energy in uh, trying to reach the policy oriented goals that, that we've described here. Uh, the interest, as you've heard in the previous couple of speakers, of uh, an MMT approach is to have policy relevance. And uh, the authority that generally has been brought to bear by people working within the modern monetary <laughs> theory framework has been the effectiveness of MMT in showing a path forward and in uh, addressing the public purpose. So in this talk, I'm going to distinguish between econometrics and statistical methods in general. And uh, my question for us will be, what is, the, uh, what is the place of econometrics, the statistical tools that the economics profession had been using, aside from uh, folks in MMT in particular? In order to do this, uh, I'm going to delve into a little bit of e uh, intellectual history. And we're going to see that dig delving into some of these roots is going to make sense of some of the practice that we've actually seen from MMT economists. Now, this work is done jointly, as you can see here, with my partner, Li Hua Chen, who's not able to be with us. I'm also grateful to Mary Baldwin University, where one of my uh, colleagues, who's, whose course I'm teaching right now, uh, also contributed greatly to completing some work that I had done on this in my dissertation. So uh, we do have a few concurrent sessions going on here. So I have a special first slide when we get this up. For those of you who might want to know, just want me to just cut to the chase and tell you what the take home message is in case you want to see, quickly have a look at the concurrent session before we get to questions and answers here. So I just undid your, your great work. Oh, there we go. OK. So, so here's what we need to, here's the, here's the cutting to the chase. So if you are seeing stars, when you do your quantitative work, when you're talking to people about doing statistics in MMT, if you're seeing stars, there's something terribly wrong. And that's my little picture of the eclipse from this summer. And you can see stars, which was greatly disturbing to people in the past, should be disturbing again here. To, uh, to find what the roots of the, this are, we go back to when this project really started to take root here at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Before we had the name MMT, the way this project was referred to was as PKI for post-Keynesian and institutionalist. And that's going to give us a hint. In fact, both Keynes and the original institutionalists had well-developed views on statistical methods. So we can look to answers in that lineage. I will contend that a methodologically consistent approach brings MMT closer to modern statistics than to econometrics, recalling the distinction I made for you at the top. The difference is one of attitude, and thus is a replacement not a complement or a substitute or uh, not a complement or a reform of the practice that we would see in uh, the mainstream curriculum, the previously mainstream curriculum. In order to uh, trace this out, I'm going to go back prior to everything, prior to both MMT and econometrics, to the origins of statistics. And here I will very gratefully thank Judy Klein <coughs> for calling my attention to John Grant's observations in the uh, 17th century. So like Warren Mosler, I'm going to cast back that far. And what we see with Grant was that he was a merchant and had certain tools for, technical tools for solving problems in his business that uh, certain developments at that time 
prompted him to bring into policy analysis and policy advising. And the tools he brought were fairly basic. You saw Linwood describing similar tools in his indices when he was picking the, checking the properties of diff different indices. You can see that here in Grant's Merchant's Rule, which is basically ta taking one thing and comparing it to another in various ways to the end of policy advising. So what was the impetus driving him to go into policy analysis? Well, around the time that he was active, uh, a, a problem was raging through England. And that was people were dying. Now, people had been dying for a long time. But they would have these periodic bouts in which when you would have had one person a week dying, at, a, at some later point, maybe toward the autumn, you'd start to get 18 people falling over in the streets dying, the plague. The plague was a very pressing issue at the time, and this prompted Grant into policy advising and policy analysis. And in that process, uh, he made, he made a, an important innovation, an important conceptual innovation that, again, here Judy Klein has called to my attention. And that is, prior to this time, people really hadn't thought in terms of individuals. And Marx goes all the way back to tracing the concept of the individual and looking to ancient Greece, where we would think of oh, democracy. Maybe we had a concept of, of individual then. And he makes the argument that, no, that was a slave-based society. And it didn't occur to them <laughs> to think in terms of people who are in some sense homogeneous and comparable to each other. The plague had a massive leveling effect in that sense. You had princes and, and paupers falling over in the street just the same, and they didn't know why. Uh, when Grant started ta tabulating and adding up, we had essentially the creation of this, this concept of a homogeneous population in which we could sweep out and add up. So this is a very important conceptual innovation. The, uh, but it was very practical. It was a problem-solving issue. And Grant was taking a problem-solving approach. And I'm going to end, end up using this as a philosophical term. Now, in the 19th century, as statistics started to further develop, we, we traced the origins of statistics to Grant. As it started to develop, it, people decide, started to take the regularities that he was able to see in populations and started to treat them as entities of their own. Uh, Pearson here starts talking in terms of modern notions of chance, in terms of probability distributions, as opposed to an earlier medieval way of uh, thinking of chance as just striking prior to these habits. Even beyond Pearson, the discipline of statistics became even more formalized under R.A. Fisher when Fisher derived optimality results for statistics like the indices and indicators that Linwood was talking about. But I write here in this slide that statistics became mathematized after, Pierce, after Fisher because after Fisher, people became even more mathematical to the point that Fisher criticized the excessive mathematization of statistics. There was, in the early 20th century, some rhetorical appeal to being very mathematical. And a certain subset of statisticians became enamored with that, drifting away from Grant's earlier problem-solving foundations. Uh, economists got even more excited about that formality, but we'll get to that later. Keynes, by contrast, going back to those roots that we would like to elucidate, contended with the mathematicians. Klein describes Keynes as being skeptical of the use of probability distributions and statistical inference in the study of economic phenomena. And we can, uh, we can substantiate that in various ways. Uh, and I will, str I will strongly contend, and I see Lord Skidelsky is in the back here, that it was not for a lack of competence that Keynes was not interested in these approaches. On the other side, the original institutionalist side, we have uh, philosophical foundations going back to Charles Sanders Peirce. He viewed chance, uh, he, he had a, a, an idea of 
Tichism, which was chance precedes law. So this is contrasting to Pearson and the laws that he was starting to project onto Grant's regularities. This foundation of the individual was very important, again, uh, starting to build up a coherent sort of summation of this philosophical approach. Uh, it, uh, it also comported with a view of human beings as particle systems. And we might here think of econophysics. The uh, approach says there are fixed laws in nature. And we contrast this with process philosophy. This will be the institutionalists and the Keynesians, which is e evolutionary and problem solving. So to uh, cut to the chase a little bit, these debates came to a head in the debate between uh, Tinbergen and Keynes on, on the side of England and between uh, the NBER approach and the Cowles Commission in the United States. It addresses some, uh, some issues that had been contentious here in, uh, in, the, in the founding of MMT, which I'll skip, skip past for now. But the point to take home from this is that there was a, an important difference between looking at the world as particle systems and looking at the world as processes. Uh, going back to, uh, going forward a, a little bit, so there are uh, some arguments that are made in favor of, of econometrics that might say, for example, well, you, you know, we might have psychological traps. We're not very good at dealing with uncertainty, so we need these tools. Uh, we can deal with them by properly working with our data and using multiple techniques from the, from the uh, process philosophy perspective. Uh, are we saying that you can't predict? No, I, I will make an argument that the over-mathematization has ended up directing a lot of our resources into work that isn't as productive as it could be. And that work is not about predicting or modeling, but rather a very specific portion of it, which is dealing with the properties of sampling distributions, where you've sampled from these fixed particle systems. So uh, there have been some attempts to treat this quantitative side from within the milieu that was here in, the, in, uh, in Kansas City. You may have heard of grounded theory, some of you. Uh, but the reason that I'm giving this talk is because I've found that some of these techniques, some of these approaches do deal with the question of looking at processes and not particle systems and grounding our concepts. But when we get to the analysis, we still see occasionally stars, even in the, the folks who uh, are pr presumably doing a more consistent theory. So how do we uh, get around uh, addressing the issues that are generally addressed by talking about sampling distributions, which would like to be saying, how sure are we that we've seen something? Well, one way that we can uh, convey our uncertainty is by sharing our data and sharing the software that we used. Reproducibility is a, is a pathway that's an alternative to the econometric approach's uh, strength there. A problem with looking only at sampling distributions for talking about the uncertainty in your work is that it, it neglects model uncertainty, which can swamp any amount of sampling uh, uncertainty that you may be able to quantify with the, uh, the, the theories of statistical inference in econometrics. So I have a little picture here. I have a much more complicated picture here to tell you that no, really, model uncertainty is an important problem, and it's not adequately addressed, statisticians say, with respect to uh, both their peers and I would say econometricians. So what to do? Going back to the way things used to be, you can look at the data. This is 18th, 19th century ways of looking at the data that led to good solutions. Here's something that uh, maybe had addressed the cholera epidemic in, in England. And we used computing back, at the, back in the day. And this is Burns and Mitchell, original institutionalists, looking at patterns much the same way that Grant did, just a little more sophisticatedly. This is Keynes' side. Again, no problem looking at data. And now with computers, we can do this much more powerfully. So uh, what does 
what does <laughs> MMT approaches to quantitative methods look like compared to econometrics then? Here's a concrete example. Scott Fulweiler looking at the money multiplier. Okay, that's an MMT topic. And there were another uh, pair of researchers, Carpenter and Demeralp, who looked at the same thing. So you look at the two-week settlement period and you see what, what happens to the, the balances that, uh, that banks are keeping. And if, uh, if there is no money multiplier, you should see something in particular. Carpenter and Demeralp measure. Fulweiler, I like to say, reads the authority's user's manual and doesn't have to measure. That's a big difference. When I talk about stars, here's what I mean. Generally, if you go to econ conferences, you'll, you'll tend to see a chart like this that has regression coefficients with stars on them. That's what I mean by stars. These three stars mean it's significant at a certain level. I would say if you're seeing this in MMT work, there's probably something wrong. What, does, what should MMT work look like? Okay. Uh, it should look like box plots, simple graphs that are close to the data. Because why? The concepts shift, uh, but when you look at the data, if, you, if they're well specified, you can see it. Here's a simple bar graph, had a big policy effect in Harrisonburg, where I'm from. Rewrote the hiring policy. Another one, our incarceration rate, had a big policy effect, just looking at the data. Here's another one that's a simple graph that had a big policy ev effect. Even more so, a simple graph, justifiable to the philosophical roots, policy relevant, and you can see here the policy effect in a small town in Harrisonburg where people were aware of MMT. You see Harrisonburg at the bottom being the capital of the resistance, voting overwhelmingly for one candidate who seemed to be somewhat aligned with MMT concepts that had been effectively messaged using these approaches. A teaser for my talk next time, here's, what, uh, here's another graphic, totally consistent, totally proper to use, showing those votes off the map and how they compared to something nearly 130 years ago that I'll talk about next time. So if we go into the tools that modern statistics has developed, they're very, very rich. And if we come to them from a good philosophical foundation, we can know how and why to use them. The, the econometricians have been interested in this as well. And they do, they do make use of them. But the distinction with MMT will be that we will, for example, it would, for example, make you sensitive to the issues of dynamics that you're bringing up. The question was, how do we deal, how do we deal with observation, observing dynamic data when we just have a one-dimensional uh, one slice? Uh, so in graphics, for example, there, there has been a lot of development in dynamic graphics. Now, that's difficult for communicating in published form, but statistics is very much dealing with these issues, and we can draw from the leading edge of statistics to, uh, to, to help us with tools for actually dealing with, with these things. Dynamic graphics in online environments are, are certainly uh, an option. How we actually observe and measure, that's a, a methodologically um, more fraught issue. Uh, Keynes had this debate with Tinbergen, and it centered around this question of homogeneous populations. By homogeneous, what Keynes meant was back to Grant. Can you compare the lord and the, and the peasant? Uh, is your concept staying the same over time will become a problem. But if it is, I, I think that we have some modern statistical tools to handle that. Is California beginning to issue its own currency? It, it, that would, that my daughter lives there. Would I have to then acquire California 
dollars of some sort if I went to visit and was hanging around in California? This well, might seem like a simple, but I, uh, I'm just. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, there, there's an exchange rate issue, right? There but, is. but I would imagine that if you came into California with greenbacks, the Californians would want to accept those greenbacks, sure. right? Uh, maybe not the other way around, California is going elsewhere. But if California at least has to pay its taxes, it has to acquire greenbacks, and it might as well get them from you as anyone else, you know. And it seems such a radical solution, though, to a national. Healthcare is a national problem. Uh, do you think it's a born of frustration in the states, or, or what, what's going on? There? Well, well I, I think it's a yeah, it's a, it's obviously a national problem. But uh, but yeah, I, uh, my last slide was you know I saw those California. I, I, if it can if it can be done in California, then there is no reason that it can't be done elsewhere. Now you know, California being a large state, might uh, Vermont being a small state, you might not you might it might not seem that you could do this in Vermont, but but you know, the radical solutions you know the problems require radical solutions. So let's say uh, California and Vermont uh, form a healthcare union. And, and, and you know, and, and, and so you know, healthcare can be can be given to uh, you know folks in Vermont by use of California dollars in Vermont for those who are wanting to take it. Uh, I, I think I think these things grow organically, right? They're not going to grow certainly because uh, the government is going to uh, come and make it, you know those in the government, Republicans or Democrats, right now are going to kind of make the right decision as to how these things happen. Uh, it, it's going to have to be some forward-looking entity, I think large enough, like California, and maybe California with New York and so forth and so on, that this grows. But, but you know, the, the bill was passed in the Senate. It got to the, to the uh, California Assembly, the House, and it was tabled because we, don't, we can't pay for this. That's an issue that MMT has something to say about. Now, just because California is a, is a state doesn't mean that we say, well, they're not sovereign in their currency. No. There are sovereign currencies popping up all over the place to, to, to deal with the issue of not being sovereign in the national currency. But I'm, I'm sovereign in the currency in my house. But it might, it, it might be actually an educational issue of raising the whole concept of a sovereign currency. Yeah. People would start to think and talk about that. Yeah. Whereas now, it's, 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 a, it's a fairly strange and foreign concept as are also people like him. Oh, well, okay. yeah, yeah, there's definitely an educational issue. Yeah. Now, uh, following up on that, you could almost say that California is too large not to have its own currency. Uh, uh, but but your, your, your uh, <coughs> radical solution is that doctors kind of are state licensed. So you can make a law in California that says you have to accept California strip as payment in order to practice medicine in California. And in order to get those doctors not to want to move over to Nevada, well, you, just, you, just, you just make it so that they can pay their taxes and then they'll be fine. Well, but you can also, even if someone did move to Nevada, you know, you've got so many plastic surgeons in California, and there's not enough doctors in the middle of the country anyway, so a few of them leave it actually becomes yeah. less than doctors. I mean, I, you know, I mean, just the general MMT uh, mantra is money is not an op uh, obstacle. You know, uh, resources. If we don't have enough doctors, nurses, and uh, other things, then we can't do those things. If we have enough of them, then, then we should we, we can be able to find a way to prov provide a currency that can circulate to get them working. And. Uh, Maybe one more question. <coughs> the balance budget must die. <laughs> is, is, is an employer of last resort policy uh, something that Euro area countries could enact unilaterally, or is it not possible under the current framework? Um, I don't think so. It could be, it could be introduced technically. But uh, I think it, it uh, will not. Uh, it, uh, it will uh, not happen in the uh, area. It's a political one and a political evaluation. Is it is it economically possible? Yes. 